Now, I'm going to do two things in this paper. The first is to endeavour to illuminate something of the context of concerns in which need to develop what we might choose to call is ethics of self-cultivation. So what's the context of concerns in which you develop that ethics? Secondly, I want to address some of the concerns that we might have about the kind of project that needs to develop it. And then look at the resources that we might find in each other for dealing or negotiating with these concerns. Uh, and finally, I also want to read some Nietzsche with you. I think it's very important that you read Nietzsche. And I've chosen two aphorisms in particular that uh, seek to do that. And so hopefully you've got a copy of that that can be passed around, a copy of two aphorisms from Dawn. And indeed, the focus of my talk is on Nietzsche's middle period writings, what Foucault called Nietzsche's witty and graceful texts. And in particular, I'm going to focus on Dawn from 1881. Now, the middle period writings, which are 1878 to 1882, are without doubt the most heavily neglected texts in Nietzsche's corpus, especially the two volumes of Human Auto Human and Dawn. And the question arises, how should we read these texts? The question is a difficult one to answer, given the multifaceted and multi-layered character of the works in question. We can find different philosophical resources in these texts, such as a naturalistic agenda that some commentators have found, or anticipations of phenomenology. I think one especially productive way to read these texts is as works of resistance. And I want to approach Dawn from 1881 as such a work. What intrigues me about the text, about Dawn, are the really examined references in the book to commercial society and to the concern over what Nietzsche calls security. There's a socio-political backdrop there to the work and to Nietzsche's attack on the presumptions of morality. And this informs his concern with self-cultivation, as we'll see. This is not to say, though, that Nietzsche is a political statement in Dawn. It would be much more incisive to describe his project at this time as one of an ethics of resistance. That's what I'm calling it. At one point in the text, Nietzsche writes, our age, no matter how much it talks and talks about economy, is a squander. It squanders what is most precious, namely spirit. He succinctly articulates his concern in the following manner. This is from Dawn 179. When he writes, political and economic affairs are not worthy of being the enforced concern of society's most gifted spirits. Such a wasteful use of the spirit is at bottom worse than having none at all. And today, he goes on to note, everyone feels obliged to know what is going on every day to the point of neglecting, he says, their own work or therapy, and in order to feel part of things. The whole arrangement, he says, has become a great and ludicrous piece of insanity. So the therapy that he's proposing in Dawn is directed at those solitary free spirits who exist on the margins or fringes of society and who seek to cultivate or fashion new ways of living and thinking and feeling, attempting to do this by taking the time necessary to work through their experience of Nietzsche. So we can describe Nietzsche, like Foucault, as a modern-day virtue ethicist who seeks to liberate the capacity of individual self-choice and personal self-formation from an oppressive conformity. I want to claim, then, that in texts such as Dawn, Nietzsche is preoccupied with a care of self and in opposition to the fundamental disciplinary tendencies of modern society. This, I think, is an important insight since it enables us to get Nietzsche right as an immoralist, at least as far as the middle period writings are concerned. He's attacking first and foremost the idea that there's something we can call a single moral-making morality. And he looks for inspiration to Hellenistic models of ethical self-formation, provided by the likes of Epicurus and Epictetus. Nietzsche's reviving a tradition of ethics that has become obscure to us today. And we can account for this obscurity in terms of several developments. And here I'm inspired by what Foucault has to say on this. Foucault notes that there has been a deep transformation in the moral principles of Western society. We find it difficult to base morality of austere principles on the precept that we should give ourselves more care than anything else in the world. Rather, we are inclined to see taking care of ourselves as an immorality, as a means to escape from all possible rules. We have inherited the tradition of Christian morality, 
which makes self-renunciation the, con the condition for salvation. Foucault writes here, to know oneself was paradoxically the way to self-renunciation. Such is our assimilation of this morality of self-denial to the point that we identify it as the very domain of morality in and for itself. And so that the kind of morality pursued by the ancients, ancients that Nietzsche's so interesting, strikes us today as an exercise in moral dandyism. As Foucault notes, we have the precept, sorry, we have the paradox of the precept of care of self that signifies for us today either egoism or withdrawal, but which for centuries was a positive principle, serving as the matrix for dedicated morality. Now Nietzsche, at least in the popular imagination, is taken to be an immoralist in the crude sense identified by Foucault, when, on the contrary, I think he needs to be read as an ethical thinker in the way that Foucault thinks we have forgotten ethics. We have developed, then, a bad conscience over an ethics centre on self-care, and regard self-renunciation as the basis of morality. As Nietzsche astutely points out in one aphorism in The Wonder and His Shadow, if we examine what is often taken to be the summit of the moral in philosophy, the summit of the moral in philosophy, namely the mastery of the effects or the passions, we find that there is pleasure to be taken in this mastery. I can impress myself by what I can be denied, defer, resist, and so on. And it is through this mastery that I grow and develop. And yet morality, as we moderns have come to understand it, would have to give this, self, this ethical self-mastery a bad conscience. And if we take it as our criterion of the moral to be self-sacrificing resolution and self-denial, we would have to say, being honest, that such acts are not performed solely for the sake of others. My own fulfilment and pride are at work, and the other provides the self with an opportunity to relieve itself through forms of self-denial. Okay, these are preliminary points, so let me now turn to a more detailed reading of the text that I'm so interested in, as a neglected moment in Nietzsche's corpus. Okay, so some background information about the text that I'm, I'm reading from, namely Dawn. Dawn is an avowedly anti-revolution work, an avowedly anti-revolution work, in which Nietzsche seeks to sever the enlightenment from revolution and to promote what he calls the philosophy of the morning, the philosophy of the morning, that he says is based on, on the one hand, slow cues, and on the other hand, small doses. He displays, therefore, a preference for individual therapy of self-cultivation over political revolution. <coughs> In the text, Nietzsche explicitly writes against those he calls impatient political invalids, and argues instead in favour of these small doses as a way of bringing about change or transformation. Is of the view that the last attempt in Europe at a transformation on a large scale of our evaluations, specifically with regards to political matters, namely the, what he calls the Great Revolution, was nothing more than a pathetic and bloody quackery. So Nietzsche is an admirer then of the critical and rationalist spirit of the Enlightenment, of both the 18th century version, as we find it in the likes of Voltaire and Lessing, and early incarnations, such as we find it in the likes of Epicurus, Petrarch, and Erasmus. He's hostile to the French Revolution throughout his life and seeks to sever the link between enlightenment and revolution because he suspects that revolution breeds fanaticism and is a throwback, he says, to a lower stage of culture. He does not deny that revolutions can be a source of vital energy for a humanity that has grown feeble, but he contests the idea that it can work as an organiser and perfecter of human nature. The task, he says, is to continue the work of the enlightenment in each and every individual, but also to strangle the revolution at birth, he said, and to ensure it does not happen. I quote from Dawn 197, the enlightenment we must now carry on, he said, unperturbed that there, existed, there has existed a great revolution, and then again a great reaction against it. Okay, so both against the revolution and against the reaction against it. And that both, in, in, and indeed, that both still exist. They are, after all, the most, that, sorry, they are, after all, the mere ripple of waves in comparison to the truly great tide in which we surge and want to surge. Now, in the book, Nietzsche is addressing what he calls, I quote, our current stressed power thirsty society in Europe and in America. He seeks to draw attention to the different ways in which the feeling of power is gratified through both individual and collective forms of agency. At this stage of his thinking, this is what he means by grand or great politics, in which he says the mightiest tide driving forward individuals, nations, and masses is the need for 
the feeling of power. Sometimes this assumes the form, he says, of the pathos or the language of virtue. And although Nietzsche has a concern over the fanatical elements of a politics of virtue, his main concern at this time is that such behaviour gives rise to the unleashing, he says, of a plethora of squandering, sacrificing, hoping, over audacious, fantastical instruments that are then utilised by amb ambitious leaders to start up wars. From Dawn 179. Nietzsche first introduces then the notion of power into his writing, neither as a metaphysical truth nor as a nor normative principle, but as a hypothesis of psychology that seeks to explain the origin and development of the various cultural forms that human beings have fashioned in order to deal with their vulnerability or their lack of power. As he points out in Dawn, in the development of human history, the feeling of powerlessness has been extended and is responsible for both the, uh, for the creation of both superstitious rituals as well as the cultural forms of religion and metaphysics. The feeling of fear and powerlessness, he says, has been in a state of perpetual <coughs> excitation for such a long time that the actual feeling of power has developed so incredibly subtle degrees and levels that it has in fact become, he says, strongest inclination. <coughs> so Nietzsche will look in the text for other forms of sublimating this feeling of power. And this is his concern with ethics, with an ethical resistance. Today he notes that although the means of the appetite for power have altered, he says the same volcano still burns within human beings. What was formerly done for the sake of God is now done for the sake of money. He says, for the sake of that which now imparts to the highest degree the feeling of power and a good conscience. He therefore attacks the upper classes, he says, for giving themselves over to sanctioned fraud. And that, he says, has the stock exchange and all forms of speculation in his conscience. And what troubles him about this terrible craving for, for and love of accumulated money is that it once again gives rise, albeit in a new form, to that fanaticism, he says, of the appetite for power that was formerly ignited by the conviction of being in possession of the truth. Through then this psychological problem of the fanatical and fantastical instincts and of the need for the feeling of power, Nietzsche is led to cultivate a deep scepticism about politics in the book and favours instead this program of therapeutic self cultivation Moreover, as he says at one point in the book, we need to be honest with ourselves and to know ourselves extremely well if we are to practice towards others, that, what he calls that philanthropic dissimulation that goes by the name of love and kindness. Ultimately, he favours then a project of free-minded social transformation in which small groups of free spirits will practice experimental lives, sacrifice themselves for the superior health of future generations, and then endeavour to get beyond their compassion and promote universal <coughs> interests so as to strengthen and elevate in this new sublimated form, the general feeling of human power. Although it is impossible, he thinks, to, to avoid generating suffering in the promotion of these new universal interests through experimental free-minded modes of living, the means to be practiced for the sublimated attainment of human power are primarily ethical ones. They involve persuasion and the setting up, as Nietzsche sees it, of new forms of pedagogy. And this, in large part, motivates his return to some of the Hellenistic models of philosophy. So let me say something about Nietzsche then as a moralist or as an ethicist in the book, Dawn. In Echi Homo, Nietzsche says that his campaign against morality, his campaign against morality, begins in earnest with Dawn. And he adds that we should not smell gunpowder at working, but he says, provided we have the necessary subtlety in our nostrils, more pleasant odours. He and Nietzsche draw in the reader's attention to something important, namely the fact that he wants to open up the possibility or there being plural ways of being, including plural ways of being moral or ethical. And so his act is not one of simple wanton destruction. And the campaign against morality that he's instigating centers largely on a critique of what he sees as the modern tendency, the tendency of his own century, to identify morality with the sympathetic effects, especially midline, compassion or pity, so as to give us a very definition of morality. Now Nietzsche has specific arguments against the value according to these effects, the sympathetic effects. But he primarily wants to advocate the view that there are several ways of living morally or ethically. At one point, for example, in the book, he writes, 
which is door 139, you say that the morality of being compassionate is a higher morality than that of stoicism. Well proved. But remember that what is higher and lower in morality is not in turn to be measured by a moral yardstick, for there is no absolute morality. So take your rule from somewhere else, he says, and now beware. With regards to the modern prejudice, which is one of the main foci of his polemic in the world, there is the presumption that we know what actually constitutes morality. Nietzsche writes, it seems to do every single person good these days to hear that society is on the road to adapting the individual to fit the needs of the throng, and that the individual's happiness, as well as his sacrifice, consists in feeling himself to be a useful member of the whole. As Nietzsche sees it then, the modern emphasis is on defining the model in terms of the sympathetic effects, especially compassion. And we think, we can, we can he thinks, explain the model in terms of a movement towards managing more cheaply, safely, and uniformly individuals in terms, he says, of their large bodies and their limits. This, he says, is the basic uh, moral current of our age. Everything that in some way supports this drive to form bodies and limits and its abetting drive is felt to be good. Now Nietzsche's main target in the book is what he sees as the fundamental tendency of modern commercial society, namely the attempt at a collectivity building project that aims at disciplining bodies and selves and so <coughs> integrating them into a uniform whole. Morality then denotes the means of adapting the individual to the needs of the whole, so making him or her a useful member of society. This requires that every, every individual is made to feel, as its primary emotion, a connectedness or bondedness with the whole, with society in which he says anything truly individual is regarded as prodigal, costly, inimical, extravagant, and so on. His great worry is that a healthy concern with self-fashioning will this be sacrificed, and this in large part informs his critique of what he sees as the current of these sympathetic effects within modernity. So he finds it necessary to contest the idea that there's a single moral making morality, since every code of ethics he writes that affirms itself in an exclusive manner destroys too much valuable energy and costs humanity to do. In the future, he hopes the inventive and fructifying person shall no longer be sacrificed, and numerous novel experiments shall be made in ways of life and modes of society. When this takes place, we will find an enormous load of guilty conscience has been purged from the world. <coughs> humanity, he thinks, has suffered for too long from teachers of morality who wanted too much all at once and sought to lay down precepts for everyone. In the future, then, care will need to be given to the most personal questions and to creating time for them. Small individual questions and experiments, he writes, are no longer to be viewed with contempt and impatience. In place of what he sees as the ruling ethic of sympathy, which he thinks can assume a form of tyrannical encroachment, he invites individuals to engage in self-fashioning, cultivating the self that others can look at with pleasure, but that still gives back to the expression, albeit in a subtle and delicate way, of an altruistic drive. And now I want to quote from the first aphorism on the handout, which is from Dawkins 174, <coughs> entitled Moral Fashion of a Commercial Society. Okay, so this writes, in this aphorism, behind the fundamental principle of the contemporary moral fashion, moral actions are generated by sympathy for others, I see the work of a collective drive towards timidity masquerading by an intellectual front. This drive desires that life be rid of all the dangers it once had, it once held, and that each and every person should help towards this end with all one's might. Therefore, only actions aimed at the common security and that society's sense of security may be accorded the rating good. How does the pleasure people take in themselves be based, however, when such a tyranny of timidity dictates to them the uppermost moral law? When, without so much as a protest, they let themselves be commanded to ignore and look beyond themselves, and yet have eager eyes for every distress and every suffering existing elsewhere. Are we not, with this prodigious intent to grate off all the rough and sharp edges from life, well on the way to turning humanity into sand? In the meantime, the question itself remains open as to whether one is more useful to another by immediately and constantly leaping to his aid, or side, sorry, and helping him which can in any case only transpire very superficially, provided they help doesn't turn into a tyrannical encroachment and transformation, or by fashioning out of oneself something that the other will behold with pleasure, a lovely, peaceful, self-enclosed garden, for instance, with high walls to protect against the dangers and dust of the roadway 
but with a hospitable gate as well. Now, as one commentator notes, those who favoured commercial society, such as the French philosophes, including thinkers such as Montesquieu and Voltaire, held that by establishing bonds amongst people, making life more comfortable, commerce softens and refines our manners, promoting humaneness and civility. Now, it's clear in the aphorism that I've just cited from that Nietzsche is expressing a deep anxiety over this development. The anxiety is namely that market driven atomization and deindividuation can readily lead to a fall of communitarian tyranny. This is the concern I think Nietzsche is expressing in an aphorism. He adds, unknown to ourselves, that we live within the effect of general opinions about the human being, which he says is a bloodless abstraction, nothing, nothing more than a fiction. Even the modern glorification of work and talk of its blessing can be interpreted, he says, as a fear of empathy individual. The subjection to hard Indian, hard industriousness from early till late in life serves, he says, as the best policeman, since it keeps everyone in bounds and hinders the development of reason, of desire, and of the craving for independence. It uses vast amounts of nervous energy, which could be given over to reflection, to brooding, to dreaming, to loving, to hating, in short, to working through our experiences. He adds, a society in which there is continuous hard work will have more security, and security is currently worshipped, he says, in our society, as a supreme divinity. We are today creating a society of universal security, but the price being paid for it, he says, is too high. The maddest thing in life is that what is being affected is the very opposite of universal security. <coughs> it's important then that we appreciate that Nietzsche is not in a text such as Dawn advocating the overcoming of all possible forms or modes of morality. Where morality centres on continually exercised self-mastery and self-overcoming in both large and small things, he champions it. His concern is that morality in the form it has assumed so far in the greatest part of human history, right up, he says, to Kant's moral law, has opened up an abundance of sources of displeasure to the point that one can say that with every refinement in morality, human beings have grown more and more dissatisfied with themselves, with their neighbour, and with their lot. The individual in search of happiness, and who wishes to become so lawgiver, which is Nietzsche's ideal, cannot be treated with prescriptions to the path to happiness, simply because, he says, individual happiness springs from <coughs> one's own unknown law and external prescriptions only serve to obstruct and hinder it. So the moral, the so-called moral precepts are in truth directed against individuals and do not aim at promoting their happiness. Indeed, Nietzsche himself, in the book, makes it clear that he does not intend to lay down precepts for everyone. He writes at one point in 194, for example, one should seek out limited circles and seek to promote the morality appropriate to them. Because that's a sort of basic overview of what I think Nietzsche is doing in a text like this with respect to ethics or morality. I now want to look at some of the concerns that we might have over this practice of ethics. Okay, so what are the concerns that we might have over this ethics of self-cultivation, this concern with itself, as articulated by Nietzsche? I want to highlight two concerns. First, is it not a form of social withdrawal, even retreat? Is it not a form of social withdrawal, even retreat? Second, does it not rest on the cultivation of a pure egoism, one that locks the self in upon itself and fails to account for the expansive and forward movement of life that requires the sharing of life with others in a project of social transformation? So let me examine both of these concerns as they get played out in Nietzsche. And what I'm going to do now is to focus a little bit on the Epicureanism that I think he's embracing at this time. Epicureanism is typically received as an anti-political philosophy. In contrast to the Stoics who philosophised in the Agora, never far from the public, Epicurus and his followers conducted philosophy in a garden that bore the injun injunction, live, live unnoticed. Another injunction was, do not get involved in political life. The school took the form of a community of friends who lived within the walls of the garden and worked together, <coughs> studying under Epicurus, writing philosophical works, and growing their own food. Going against the mores of the time, it was open to both slaves and to women. So the school was a community based on friendship, and friendship was considered by the Epicureans to be the most important thing of all. The ideal mental state to obtain 
For the Epicurean is this ataraxia that uh, John talked about this morning, freedom from disturbances or tranquility. And to achieve this, the philosopher has to withdraw from the disturbances of everyday life as much as possible, including public affairs, which are seen to be a particular cause of mental disquiet and disturbance. Now, although Nietzsche has his own independent reasons for shunning politics at this time, he does have a concern with self-care and self-healing in his middle period that influences his judgments about politics. He appropriates Epicurean teaching for the ends of an ethical reformation in one sense. He shows little interest in Epicurean atomism at this time, and he does not look to Epicurus as did the early marks for a doctrine of freedom in which the swerve breaks with the bonds of faith. In Nietzsche, there's a commitment to what, what Nietzsche himself calls a refined egoism that takes its chief inspiration, I believe, from Epicurus. For example, one of the earliest references to Epicureanism in his corpus is an incidental remark that he makes in Schopenhauer's Educator, where he says that to write today in favour of an education that sets goals beyond money and acquisition, that takes a great deal of time, and that encourages solitude, is likely to be disparaged as, as on the one hand, refined egoism, and on the other, as immoral cultural appearance. Now, Epicurus does not become an important component in Nietzsche's published philosophy until around 1878-79, that is the start of the early period of life. And it's in these terms of a refined egoism that he draws on Epicurus again and becomes inspired by certain Epicurean notions and ideas, including this idea of friendship. So at this time, Nietzsche is inspired by the Epicurean conception of friendship and the ideal of withdrawing from society and cultivating one's own garden. In a letter to his amanuensis Peter Gantz, Peter Gast, in 1883, Nietzsche writes that Epicurus, he writes, Epicurus is the best negative argument in favour of my challenge to all rare spirits to isolate themselves from the mass of their fellows. Like Epicurus, Nietzsche's philosophy of philosophical therapy is in search of pupils and disciples. He writes again to Gast in another letter, what I envy in Epicurus are the disciples in his garden. In such circumstances, one could entirely forget noble Greece and more certainly, still, in the noble journey. And in the gay science, he advises his free spirits to live as follows. So this is the gay science 338. He says, live in seclusion so that you, you can live for yourself. Live in ignorance about what seems most important <coughs> to your age. The clamour of today, the noise of wars and revolutions, should be a mere murmur for you. You would also wish to help but only those whose distress you understand in time, because they share with you one suffering and one hope, your friends, and only in the manner in which you help yourself. I want to make them bolder, more persevering, simpler, and gay. And each is ethical commitment. It's clear, it's, it's clear from his articulation of it in Door 179. It involves a taking of pleasure and a care for self that strives for independence and self-sufficiency. One does not completely isolate oneself from others, but neither does one seek to effect a tyrannical encroachment upon it. Instead, one offers what Nietzsche calls a hospitable gate through which others can freely enter and leave. And through self-cultivation, one fashions a style of existence that others can behold with pleasure. So in opposition to what Nietzsche sees as the desert of undifferentiated atoms offered by a modern commercial society, he provides this image of an oasis, one that depicts neither the past glories of Homeric agonism, nor the resplendent isolation of the noble individual. The image that he comes up with, a self-enclosed garden, clearly draws on ideas of paradise in the Western tradition. And our word for paradise, etymolog etymologically, derives from the Persian for war of God. And Nietzsche is coming up with this image to counter the Christian idea of a locked gate, or porta closet. So to cultivate oneself then is to create oneself as a paradise garden for Nietzsche. For the other. Okay, so what I've been trying to establish then is that Nietzsche is employing this idea of a care of self in the text such as Dawn, specifically as a way of taking to task what he identifies as the developments, troubling developments <coughs> within modern European society. Here the chief goal or end of the cultivation of the so here the chief goal or end of the cultivation is is free or self-sufficient, self-sufficient. 
But in addition to Epicurus, we need to acknowledge that Nietzsche also draws on Stoic figures, notably Epictetus, as a way of promoting this care of self. What he admires in Epictetus, interestingly, is what he called a non-fanatical mode of living. Okay, this is what Nietzsche locates in Epictetus, a non-fanatical mode of living. He says, although this ancient thinker was a slave, the exemplar that he invokes is without class and is possible within everything. He serves as a counterweight, Nietzsche says, to modern idealists who are greedy for expansion. His ideal human being lacks all fear of God and believes rigorously in reason. is not a preacher of penitence. He has a pride in himself that he does not wish to trouble and encroach upon others. He admits, Nietzsche says, a certain mild approachment and does not wish to spoil anyone's good mood. Yes, he can smile. There is a great deal of ancient humanity in this idea. So the Epictetus is self-sufficient, defends himself against the outside world, and lives in a state of the highest value. And each offers this portrait, again, as a, as a contrast to the Christian. The Christian for Nietzsche is somebody who lives in hope, in the consolation of unspeakable glories to come, and allows himself to be given gifts, expecting the best of life not to come from himself and his own resources, but from divine love. By contrast, he says, Epictetus does not hope and does allow his best to be given him. He possesses it, he holds it valiantly in his hand, and he would take on the whole world if he tries to rob him off. But let me return to my question. What are the concerns that we might have over this as a way of life, this ethics as a way of life? Or it might be argued that Nietzsche presents our becoming ethical in uninviting terms. We are to remove ourselves from the mass of humanity. We need to endure long periods of solitude, and we need to resist the temptation of the sympathetic affection. In particular, as Nietzsche said, we need to get beyond our compassion. Now, writing in Nietzsche's time, in 1878, the French, neglected French philosopher Jean-Marie Guillaume writes in praise of ancient and modern Epicureanism, but makes a fundamental <coughs> criticism of the doctrine when he argues that the Epicurean conception of self development is limited by its attachment to pure egoism. This is from his um, book um, called The Morality of Epicurus from 1878. To what extent is this critical point applicable to Nietzsche's own interest in Epicurean philosophy? Is it the case, as one commentator has argued, that Nietzsche is more concerned with narcissism than with relatedness? This is uh, by Eliot Jurist in a book called Beyond the Hate of Nietzsche. It is widely thought that Nietzsche invokes a notion of subjectivity as self-absorbed, as something whole to itself, fully represented and self-contained. Indeed, in his consideration of the self and other in Nietzsche, Eliot Juris notes that Nietzsche's concern is with self-gratification, largely with self-gratification, and argues that this concern interferes with the way in which he characterizes the relationship between self and other, and moreover that he leaves the issue of our relation to others unresolved. Nietzsche, he writes, himself acknowledges the social constitution of ages. Yet he opts not to pursue this, and not to concentrate fully on coming to terms with the experience of being for a man. Now I want to offer a partial defence of Nietzsche against this criticism. To begin with, I think it's prudent to bear in mind the following point, namely that Nietzsche's supposedly scientific analysis or analyses of morality have a therapeutic intent. So that when he praises egoism rather than just describing it, he's deliberately compensating for the calumny that has suffered and continues to suffer in the majority of moral frameworks. Still, having acknowledged this or uh, recognised this point, it's important that Nietzsche provides his readers with models of the relation between the self and its other. And I think he does attempt something of this in a way that, was, that seeks to respect personal integrity um, in Dawn in particular. So my view, then, is that the criticism that we might make of Nietzsche's commitment to egoism is largely misplaced. On the one hand, it's clear that he is of the view that self-love needs to form the basis of an adequate relation to others. So for Nietzsche, we go wrong when we fail to attend to the needs of the ego and flee from it. For him, he writes, we can stick to the idea that benevolence and beneficence are what constitute a good person. But such a person, he says, must first be benevolently and beneficently disposed towards himself. A bad <coughs> person is one that runs from himself and hates himself, causing an injury to himself. Such a person is rescuing himself from himself in others, 
And this running from the ego, living in others and for others, as Nietzsche says, heretofore been called, just as unreflectively as well assuredly, unegotistical and consequently good. And Nietzsche is very skeptical about that position. Right? On the other hand, it is also clear that he thinks we do have duties to others. His concern is with how this can be transformed into something pleasurable, or as he puts it, become occasions for pleasant feelings within us. And he acknowledges that this can only take place after several years of practice. In addition, one also needs to pay attention to Nietzsche's conception of what he calls ideal selfishness, again in Dorf, ideal selfishness. Here one cares for the soul, he says, guards over it and keeps it in repose in order to try and ensure that one's fructification comes to a beautiful conclusion. In this immediate way, he thinks, we actually care for <coughs> God over the benefit of the Lord. Indeed, he said, living in this proud and tempered mood serves as a balsam that extends far and wide around us, even into restless souls. Indeed, in the text, Nietzsche is keen to expound the cause of a new kind of teacher or pedagogue, who armed, he says, with a handful of knowledge and a bag full of experiences, becomes a doctor of the spirit of the individual, and who is able to aid people here and there, whose head is disturbed by opinions. <clears throat> the aim is not to prove that one is right before another person, but rather says <coughs> to speak with them in such a way that they say what is right, and proud of the fact, walk away. Such a teacher exists, he says, like a beacon of light, offering illumination. And he imagines this teacher existing in the manner of a new kind of cure of overburdened souls, inspired by what he calls a new sublime. I now want to read the longer second, more enigmatic aphorism on the handle. This is from Dawn Again, it's number 449 from Book 5, the final part of the text. Okay, this is really enigmatic, so let me read it. Uh, how it nauseates me to impose my thoughts on another. How I take pleasure in every mood and secret conversion within myself, by which the thoughts of others prevail over my own. From time to time there occurs an even higher celebration, when for a change one is allowed to give away one's spiritual house and possessions, like the father confessor who sits in the corner, eager for one in need to come and recount the travail of his thoughts, in order that he, the father confessor, might once again fill his hand and heart and lighten his burdened soul. Not only does he eschew all praise for what he does, he would also like to avoid any gratitude, for gratitude is invasive and has no respect for solitude and silence. He seeks to live nameless or lightly ridiculed, too humble to awaken envy or enmity, armed with a head free of fever, a handful of knowledge and a bag full of experiences, to be, as it were, a doctor of the spirit of the indigent, and to aid people here and there whose head is disturbed by people, without their really noticing who was helping. Not to be right vis-a-vis -vis this person, and to celebrate the victory, but to speak with him in such a way that after a tiny unobserved hint or objections, he himself says what is right, and proud of this fact walks away. Like a modest hostel that turns away no one in need, that is, however forgotten about afterwards or left, to have no advantage, neither better food nor purer air, nor a more joyful spirit, but to share, to give back, to communicate, to grow forward, to be able to be humble so as to be accessible to many and humiliating to none, to have experienced much injustice, and have crawled through the worm tunnels of every kind of error in order to be able to reach many hidden souls along their secret paths, always in a type of love and a type of self-interest and self-enjoyment, to be in possession of a dominion and at the same time inconspicuous and renouncing, to lie constantly in the sun and the kindness of grace, and yet to know that the paths rising to the sublime are right at hand. Nietzsche concludes that would be a life. That would be a reason to live, to live a long time. Okay, deeply enigmatic of herself. And what the reference is to the sublime will not be the time to Now, this aphorism poses a number of interpretive challenges. It's clearly essential to any interpretation of Nietzsche at this time on the relationship between the self and its others. The way Nietzsche envisages this relation is extraordinarily complicated. In the aphorism, he's envisaging a modest existence of the self, moving away from matters of the body not indulging oneself with better food, to matters of the soul, not even having a more joyful spirit, and entailing a mode of existence that shares returns of community, freely making oneself poorer in this manner of being and dwelling. Is he refers to it as a humble mode of living. 
one suffers from existence, such as the vulnerability of the self, and yet still profits from one's experiences of life to the point where one can aid and instruct others. One can love and one can attend to the needs and cares of the self at the same time. One constructs a dominion, as he says, but in a way that is not self-centered, but in fact self -nest. Living in this manner, one can wish to live well and on the ascending path to the sublime. That is what I take to be peaks of elevated existence, in which from the vantage point of the heights one has climbed, one can look down upon the experiences of life that have been conquered and overcome. So it gives one a sense of triumph, a sense of self-satisfaction. The portrait depicted is clearly that of some kind of sage, a person who has tempered emotional and mental excess, is armed, he says, with a head free of fever, a handful of knowledge and a bag full of experiences, and that can be this doctor's spiritual indigo. And one lives without praise or gratitude, silently even names. Now the aid offered to others is therefore of a delicate kind. One seeks to preserve one's own space in this process, and to ensure that the integrity of the other person is respected. Again, he has got this concern of preventing what he calls the tyrannical encroachment over others taking place. Now, love is perhaps a strong word for Nietzsche to use in this example, but it's clearly hinting at a special mode of care of others, or one that is not at all free of self-interest and self enjoyment Now, such an aphorism, I think, clearly shows that Nietzsche's campaign against morality by which he says he means the morality of unselfing, possesses a complicated character, at least as it's articulated in the text I've been focusing on. So as far as I can see, there's no celebration in Nietzsche of a pure egoism or an immature egoism. His focus on the self and on the ego egoism is of a highly ethical character in two senses. Firstly, it has a concern with the uh, discipline of self-cultivation, and secondly, this cultivation is not without care for others including the duties and responsibilities that come with such care. Okay, let me now turn to my conclusion and return to the fundamental concerns that Nietzsche has in the book I've been focusing on. Now, like Foucault, I think Nietzsche is not advocating some ahistorical return to the ancients in Dawn. In the book, for example, he highlights the teaching of Epictetus as a way of indicating that what we take to be morality today, where it is taken to be coextensive with the sympathetic effects, is not a paradigm of some universal or meta-historical truth. So if we look at the history of Nietzsche, we find that there have been different ways of being ethical. And this itself, in itself, is sufficient to derail the idea that he wants to do that there's a single moral link in morality. Both Nietzsche and Foucault then seek to work against the construction of moral necessity out of historical contingency. A key difference from the ancients is that they need to develop a thick therapy for the sicknesses of the soul under what he sees as specifically modern conditions of social control and discipline. That's the context in which he's developing his ethics of self cultivation and why I'm seeing it as an ethics of resistance. Now, I think we find in Dawn and the resistance that it mounts. A clear rebuttal of what Roberto Esposito construes as the guiding idea of modern political thought, namely the idea of preserving life through the abolition of difference and heterogeneity. Esposito goes so far as to claim that although Nietzsche did not formulate the term, he nevertheless, I quote, anticipated the entire biopolitical course that Foucault then developed, defined and developed. One can say so, that all the Foucaultian categories are present in a nutshell in Nietzsche's conceptual language. As he rightly notes, Nietzsche challenges the idea that the human species is ever given once and for all. Rather, it is susceptible in good and evil in life to be molded in forms for which we do not have exact knowledge, but which nevertheless constitute for us both an absolute risk and an inalienable challenge. <coughs> and he quotes from Nietzsche from 1881, a note of 1881, on the selection of a human where, quoting Nietzsche, Nietzsche writes, why should we not realise in the human being what the Chinese are able to do with the tree, producing roses on the one side and on the other side pears? <clears throat> Nietzsche's ambition in Dawn, I think, is clear on the following note, and it centres on the experiment of cultivating what we can call human pluralisation and working against this closure of the human that Nietzsche detected in the modern period. 
So let me end with this quote from the necklace of the time of war, Nietzsche's. <clears throat> Summing up his morality or his ethic. He says, My morality would be to take the general character of man more and more away from him, to make him to a degree not understandable to others, and with it an object of experience, of astonishment, of instruction. <clears throat> should not each individual be an attempt to achieve a higher species of man? Sorry, should not. And so again, should not each individual be an attempt to achieve a higher species than man through its most individual thing? 